Spirit. Amen. The Christians in the Middle East are under persecution from ISIS. They're under persecution from a militant Islamic group. This is a kind of militant Islam, an interpretation of Islam that we see present not only today, but that was present in 1915 when our own people were massacred. We see the terrible persecution the people are enduring, and yet in the midst of this we see such wonderful examples of faith, people who are choosing to lay down their lives rather than deny their faith in Jesus Christ, people that are choosing earthly death so that they might have heavenly life. We can be thankful that we are not in a situation where we're being attacked that way, but we have to realize simultaneously that we are in a situation where we are being attacked in a very real way. We're being attacked each and every day within America. We are in the midst of a spiritual war, a war for the souls of our children, a war for the souls of our husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, mothers, friends, all those that we know, and the devil has many tactics that he uses to attack our faith, to attack the church of God. We are under attack. An example of how we are attacked is the temptation that we have to value the acceptance of man more than the acceptance of God. This temptation is of unholy origin. And an example of people that do this is found in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 12, we read, Many of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Indeed, openly recognizing Jesus, being open about our faith, sharing the teachings of our Lord, naming them as the teachings of Christ, doing these things puts us in a situation where we will face rejection from other people, from friends from family members sometimes even. We are not to be like those who value worldly acceptance more than the praise of God. We are to praise our Lord openly, and when we do so, God blesses us, He blesses the church, and He increases the harvest of souls for His kingdom. Consider the faith that was exhibited by the apostles. In Acts chapter 5, the apostles were called below before the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin of the day, and the apostles had been continuing to profess Jesus Christ as a promised Messiah, as the one who fulfilled the prophecies. And because they wouldn't cease doing so, they were called before the Sanhedrin and they were flogged, they were whipped. And we read what happened after that. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. If we are holy, if we are one with God, we will rejoice in having the opportunity to sacrifice and to suffer for his name. If we are holy, we will understand that the temptation we have to avoid suffering is a temptation that has its origin in the devil. When God calls us to stand for him, and standing for him leads to suffering and sacrifice, we are called to do so just the same. The devil also attacks the church through false teachings. In 2 Peter we read, But there were also false prophets amongst the people, even as there will be false teachers amongst you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and many will follow in their destructive ways. There were destructive teachings, false teachings about Jesus in the first century, and there are today. But the best defense against false teachings, the best defense against false prophecy are well-informed Christians. It is incumbent upon us to seek out, to gain a knowledge about the true gospel of Jesus Christ, to meditate upon its meaning, to embody those teachings, and to share those teachings with others. The devil does not want us to believe in Jesus at all, but if we are to believe in Jesus, he wants us to have a belief in a false Jesus. He wants to have us to have a belief in a distorted view of Jesus, so he floods the world with false teachings as to who Jesus is. He floods the church, too, with false understanding as to who Jesus is, and we have to be on guard against this. In 
in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Today, many people have itching ears. They go to the internet to have that itch scratched. They look to magazines and a variety of books that give strange interpretations of Jesus and of the history of the church. And rather than accept the tradition that's been handed down from the first century, they have their itch scratched by whatever suits them in the modern era. They end up choosing the version of Jesus they like most, a custom-made Jesus for their own satisfaction rather than the Jesus of the gospel who challenges us and challenges us in ways that sometimes we might not be happy with. But he challenges us to the truth. The one true apostolic church has maintained the orthodox doctrine of Jesus through the centuries, and our call is a sacred one. Our call is to preserve and to present a true version of God in the midst of all kinds of false teachings about Christ. We have maintained the light of Christ since the time of Christ. We are called to be the light in the darkness. We're called to be clarity in the fog. We're called to be a clear voice of the gospel in the static of the world. We're called to be the mouthpieces of God on this earth and to stand for and speak his teachings. We do this when it is easy and we do it with love and the strength when it is hard. We are called to make sure the true doctrine of the true gospel is maintained and preached and preserved and passed on to the next generation. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready, convince, rebuke, exhort, this with all long-suffering and teaching. This has been our mission since day one. We preach and stand for the word, even when it means we have to suffer for doing so. We have to rebuke. We have to argue for the true gospel. In other words, we're to stand for this one revelation that we have received. And when we do so, understand that we are building up the church. We are supporting the revelation of Christ as passed on through the ages. So the church is attacked physically. The church is attacked by having people by trying to make people want the, the approval of man rather than the approval of God. The church is attacked by false teachings. The church is also attacked through worldliness. A worldliness that includes immorality and materialism. Immorality is lust of the flesh. Materialism is lust of the eyes. And both are included in the love of the world. In 1 John, we read, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Satan uses worldliness to try to destroy churches, to try to destroy Christians. He tries to make the church fruitless, through worldliness. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus is teaching about how people respond to the word of God using the imagery of a seed that is planted and how that seed grows. And he says, Now the seeds that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard the word, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and the pleasures of life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. The devil wants us, if we're going to hear the true gospel of God, he wants us ultimately to be either confused about what the true message is or to be choked by worldly cares and concerns and riches. God calls us to break free of the chains of worldliness by offering up our lives all that we are and all that we have in sacrifice to God, understanding that we are stewards of what belongs to Him. The world and all that is in it is mine, says the Lord, if we think we own every, anything we deceive ourselves. All things belong to the Lord. We are but stewards of his riches. In Romans chapter 12, from today's epistle reading, you heard, I beseech you therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love the use of that word, reasonable. It is reasonable to sacrifice to God, and not to sacrifice to God is unreasonable. The source of reason is the Logos, is the Word of God. Jesus is the reason of the Father. And as we live in communion with Jesus, we will want to do the reasonable thing, following Jesus' example, to sacrifice, to build up the kingdom, and to glorify our Heavenly Father. So the church is attacked physically and spiritually. It's attacked by false teachings. It's attacked by worldliness. And one more way I want to mention this week that the church is attacked is that it's attacked through a temptation to indifference. A temptation to indifference. This is a subtle yet effective weapon used by Satan against Christians. You know, I don't like Brussels sprouts. I don't like mushrooms. I tell some people that and they say, how can you not like Brussels sprouts? They're the most, they're the most delicious things. Mushrooms are incredible. I don't like them. Now, of course, I don't have perfect taste. But God has perfect taste. God knows what's tasteful. And God knows what's distasteful. And he tells us what's distasteful to him in Revelation 3 in very powerful and very graphic terms. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God finds it distasteful when people are lukewarm about their faith. God finds it distasteful when people think that their souls can be filled by the riches of this world, by material gifts. God knows that they can only be satisfied by living in right relationship with Him and seeking out right relationship with one another. God hates indifference. He calls us to be on fire for Him. He calls us to be enthusiastic and theos, to have God within us. We are not to be cold, we are not to be lukewarm, but on fire. Our goal is to live in a joyous, vibrant relationship with God and one another. St. Gregory of Nautic, who wrote the Book of Lamentations, the Book of Nautic, probably the greatest spiritual writing in Armenian church history, said the following, I long not so much for the gifts as for the giver. I yearn not so much for the glory as for the glorified. So we are not to be indifferent, but we are to live our lives on fire. The world tells us not to care too much about God or to think, you know what? I've done my part. I've cared enough. I've served the church enough. It's someone else's turn. It's someone else's turn to serve, or I'm too busy to serve. The world wants us to think this way, but Scripture teaches us in Galatians 6, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and towards good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching of our Lord's return. May the sacrifice of Coptic Christians and the blood of our own Armenian martyrs inspire us to stay the course, to offer up our bodies and indeed our very lives in joyous sacrifice to the one who sacrificed all for us and to whom, together with the Father and Holy Spirit, is befitting eternal glory now and unto the ages of the